Hello, hello, and welcome. Welcome to everyone joining us for this fabulous Trek panel. Um, I myself am Raven Dowda, and I'm here with some extraordinary guests today. I'm going to allow them to introduce our, themselves, and uh, we're here to have some fun. So who are we with today? Hi, guys. Michelle Hurd here, uh, Rafi from Star Trek Picard. The one and only, and the fabulous, absolutely. I'm <laughs> Sirach Lofton. I'm also Jake Sisko from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and I'm glad to be here with you, Raven. Yeah. I'm really glad to be sharing this with you guys. Um, there's also another fabulous Trek actor uh, who may be joining us. It's a surprise, so we'll see if he joins in, and uh, we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is a really special time, and I'm really honored to have... Oh! Oh, look at that! <laughs> here we go. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I don't know if all of you all know this fabulous gentleman. His name Hi. is Conrad Coates. Conrad, you joined at the perfect time. We actually just started, literally signed on. We're doing the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you uh, look fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, please say who you are for all the fans out there. Uh, I'm uh, Conrad Coates. I'm here in Toronto. I play uh, Captain Trell in um, Star Trek Discovery. Thank you. And I actually even forgot to mention, I play um, Dr. Tracy Pollard um, in Star Trek Discovery as well. So we are here. We have three treks, three treks in one presence. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And today I feel like we're going to be talking about diversity, mm -hmm. diversity in the Trek universe and, and what that is and who we are. We're going to just talk a little about, a bit about um, what we've done, where we've come from and... Uh, I think we're gonna have a good time. Um, so uh, I have some questions for everyone, and uh, like once again, feel free to just join in and, and share what you feel. Um, but one of them is just the what was our first role? What was our first role as actors that we had? If we feel like sharing them, anything that <laughs> comes to mind? Lord, I think I remember right. Because we've all been doing this for a minute. We've for all been doing this for a while. It's not like we just rolled up out of bed and then all of a sudden was on Star Trek. Um, my very first one, I'll actually jump in and start off first. My first one was Murder at 1600. Ooh. And oh, yeah. uh, I was so just squeaky out of school. I auditioned for it. It was like a part of the waitress, you know. The role doesn't even have a name, just the waitress. <laughs> and I was so excited auditioning for it. I had one line and it was, get you something. That, that was the line. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I get the script, you know, and this was back in the day when they send you a script and I'm flipping through it with my mom and my brother. We're so excited. We get to the part of the waitress and it's been cut to coffee. Oh, oh my <laughs> <laughs> one word, that word, coffee. Yeah. Don't you know? I practiced that one word. I don't know. I must have said it two hundred different ways. Coffee, coffee. coffee. <laughs> My brother to this day still, you know, teases me about how I went over that, and it was amazing. I mean, I I, I got to work with um, Diane uh, Lane, Diane Lane, and um, our guy there. Oh my goodness. Why am I drawing a blank? Oh, Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. Blade. Yeah, Snipes. The Blade. Wesley Snipes. Snipes. And yes. uh, yeah, that was awesome. That was, that was Nino it. Brown himself. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I got, you know, I, I really, I can't, I can't really remember my first. I, you know, I'm a native New Yorker and I went to school, Boston University School for Theater Arts. And when I got back here, um, I just did a ton of theater. I was doing, I did so much theater, like no paying theater gigs that I, I felt like I had to like join a no paying theater gigs anonymous or something, you know, the phone would ring and I'd be like, yes, I'd be like shit, you know. <laughs> um, so then I, I, I knew that I needed to figure out a way to make money. Um, so I actually did a bunch of, uh, I signed up with Sylvia Fay Extra Casting. I did tons of background, um, background work. So much so that a lot of the ADs knew who I was just on different show on different films. And there was one film I was doing background on and an actress uh, got sick or didn't show up or something and they needed an actress to play a wife. Um, and that was on King of New York. Um, and they looked at me and they were like, Michelle, come here. And I was Roger Smith's wife on uh, King of New York. Um, and the scene was with Roger, Christopher Walken, directed by Abel Ferrari. And I was literally like, you know, 
I'm gonna be really good here. Don't do, don't mess up, don't mess up. Um, and so that kind of got me into like that kind of world. And and then, and then I started just doing. Um, I'm trying to think of like a good part. I mean, I did. I got a soap opera uh, called Another World, and I played Dana Kramer, District Attorney Dana Kramer. And I, I remember my first day shooting that. I'm a, I'm a the DA, and uh, there's a court case. And I remember my very first day. I'm doing an opening. Um, arguments and they have all the like the you know the grand dams the you know the stars of the show in the in the courtroom and I mean like I you know I'm right out of school I my knees were like shaking you know you're trying to be really cool and you're just like you know my body's like trembling uh but it was really it was a fun experience and I think from that moment I was all into doing law kind of you know legal and cops and stuff like that or Conrad. Yeah. Oh, uh, Conrad, after you, please. Uh, well, of course, I'm going to say my first role was on a show called The Campbells, which was all the little house on the prairies. Oh. I was a runaway slave, of course. <laughs> uh, and yes. uh, But what was so great about that gig was um, I got writing lessons. I got to write mm -hmm. a book for a week, for a week. Wow. I actually shot anything. So I think, and that's a skill I still actually have now. So I was really, really happy about booking that. Of course, it's your first gig, regardless. And then, you know, being on this animal that I've always wanted to write ever since I was a kid, I was just mm -hmm. so happy just to be able to just get up on this animal for a couple hours every day before we mm -hmm. shot and, and go for actual writing lessons. But of course, you know, we had to play the runaway slave. <laughs> Yeah. <sighs> playing many of those yeah. roles <laughs> right right uh, my first acting experience was in in school actually i i remember in fourth grade we were doing a school play and it, yeah it was martin luther king and there was only like two black kids in my school at that time so i had a real easy job of getting the martin luther king role <laughs> but it was I was nine years old and that was my first like being on stage doing a play and being the lead in a play. Wow. And even though it wasn't a real gig, it was just my first taste of acting hmm. and and getting the feedback from the audience and the teachers and principal and I just really felt connected with that um medium. So I said, Oh, this is something I can do. But the first acting gig that I got was a commercial for the um the US Army and I was just playing a boy who was growing up and would eventually join the army so that mm -hmm. was just, that was also fun for me to just kind of be on the set and and, yeah. and and just feel you know feel the energy of that but I was also around a lot of adults so it was also a little bit intimidating and mm -hmm. and uh, a lot to soak up yeah it's really interesting because um Conrad, you know, you talk about playing a slave and, and it's funny because the majority, or not funny, um, because the majority of roles, especially starting out that I would go out for would be the stereotypical, like either you're a slave mm -hmm. or you're a hooker mm -hmm. or you're, you're a poor person, mm -hmm. you're, you're on drugs, you're like somehow disenfranchised person. Um, and it was something back then that it was just the norm. Like that was just, those are the roles that I'd be going out for. And I mean, thank goodness, thank goodness there's been a, a progression and a change in that. But I kind of mm -hmm. feel like it still happens to a degree where, yeah. you know, the opportunities provided, yes, I'm saying that it is changing, but it's still that those stereotypes that, they're there because it's so commonplace so they kind of reinforce themselves so then that's what that's what we're called to go out for yeah, you know? yeah. and then I ran into a problem of being you know born in Ottawa Ottawa Valley Canadian girl um didn't have those life experiences growing up thank god um yes it was challenging but not to the degree of like you know your mother's a crack addict and you're you know, it wasn't to the degree of that and yet that is what i was called to recreate time and time again and and because i wouldn't talk a way that was recognizable as being you know mm -hmm. street or what have you mm -hmm. it was it was it, it, it was something to maneuver again through in developing my acting career. And I found that coming up to it time and time again was, 
was frustrating, but it was something that that's what all my other friends went through as well, like as, yeah. as, as actors and actresses, those types of roles. And so um, I just asked you guys to the panel, like how, how did you find that as well? Was that something that you were constantly called to, to play roles that were not necessarily something that you felt represented mm -hmm. <laughs> who you are as a person? Like putting mm -hmm. on, it's like putting on another cloak. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting, I, I talked about being on another world, you know, a soap opera and yeah. being a DA. And um, there was a, another, a, a white man, Steven Schnitzer, who was the other, like the prosecutor, the other, my counter person. And we worked a lot together and we were having a really fun time. And he'd been, he has more seniority and all that kind of stuff. And he talked to me and he was like, I think that, you know, they should, we should see if they have Dana and, you know, my character get together. And he brought it to the producers and literally <laughs> the producers were like, no. There's no way that that is, that we're going to have this black, white thing on this show, period, end of discussion. Um, and so then I remembered as we continued on in the, the year or a couple of years or whatever, um, they decided to bring on a, a partner for Dana. And so we had all this sort of casting call with all these black men, right? And um, then finally we, you know, we're now we have the black woman and the black man and we're doing our thing. And then during the holiday season, if you think about soap operas, they would always do this sort of thing where you would have a moment where a soap opera actor would say, you know, hey, you know, Merry Christmas to you from our family to yours, station KTL or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, they asked everybody to do that, except for us, except for us. And I remember um, Eric Leroy Harvey, uh, we were sitting at the, you know, we were getting ready to shoot a scene and we're, we're you know, we're sitting at a table and cameras here and he just, and they said action and he just turns to the camera and he goes, you know, you know, from our family to yours, you know, Merry Christmas, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, did you not want us to do that? Oh, oh, oh I see. I just thought maybe you might want, you forgot to ask yeah. him. You know, it was really like bristly and, you know, nobody wanted to address it. It was really um, uh, uncomfortable. And I, I remember also taking away from the soap the female leads, the ingenues, the love interests. And I remember watching, because I was a DA, and even though they had paired us, I was basically asexual, because you don't, they don't need to tap into that, right? They've already got their quota, they have their token, they don't need to get into past sexualities. You know, that's how, the, how they would handle it. And I remember seeing how these women were dealt with and, and, uh, and objectified, you know? Um, and so when I started, you know, having not even having a say of parts that I got, I told my people, I was like, look, and I think I've said this before, if there's an option uh, between a choice between a character that's wearing heels and a tight dress or carrying a gun and carrying a badge, I'll take the gun badge. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in this. I don't want to be an object. I don't want to be someone's girlfriend or wife. Or I don't want to be the, you know, sexualized anything. I want to, I want to be, I want to have power. I want to have say. I want anybody who looks like me to see this woman is smart, strong, stands by herself, <laughs> makes decisions by herself about the situation, doesn't need the help of a man. Um, and I, I think I've tried really hard to, uh, to sort of do that the whole time. But I will tell you that, um, you know, the whole asexual thing, when you're a, co when you're a cop, a detective, uh, a judge, um, any of those things as a woman of color, you're either divorced, um, with children, um, you, your, 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 your husband might have died, um, or you might be gay. Like they just, they just don't want to tap into possibly, yeah, your, your actual sexuality and you, um, possibly having, cause you know why? Cause they don't want to deal with who your partner's going to be. They don't want to deal with that conversation. You know, it's changing. It's absolutely changing, but for sure that was, um, that, back then, that's what I really was experiencing. Like, wow, this is, uh, I'm seeing this way. And by the way, whenever, when I went to college, Boston University, I played every single ethnic character. Like, I never played a white character. And I, I had to tell them at like my third, my senior year, I said, I, I, I think there's a confusion here because I have no problem being a minority. I got that down. Like, so I walk into a room, someone's like, that's a minority. You know, I don't have to work <laughs> on that. But I, I came to college so that I would have the opportunity to play Juliet, not the nurse. Right. Because I put my money down just like she did. Right. Mm -hmm.
-hmm. And so that was a conscious choice for you that you felt <clears throat> all, like throughout your career. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, I mean, others can answer the question, absolutely. But um, just to speak to you, Michelle, do you, how do you feel that has changed now from then to where you are now? For me or for women of color or people of for color? For yourself personally and or for women of color. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see that there's more opportunities there and there are other characters now. And there are other choices to do something other than being like the law and the, you know, the boss in charge. Uh, but I'm, I mean, like I, I just did Bad Hair with Justin Simmons. And, you know, I loved it. But that's a, that's a black show, you know, it was a black um, film. So I felt just taken care of. You know, I, I, I was really happy to be a part of it. I wanted to tell that story. It was, you know, it's about, it's about our, our obsession with hair, you know, and, and to what state, you know, lengths that we will go to get our extensions, to get our, you know, our tracks in, to, you know, do all that stuff. The bleeding, the scalp, you know, the, you know, we go through some crazy shit for what somebody says is pretty. And that's why, you know, I constantly, and I'm, I mess with my hair and I do all this stuff because I want to, this is, this is how it comes out. This is, it's a beautiful thing. We don't have to all look the same, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's changing, uh, you know, but I don't know if you guys feel this. It feels very um, manipulated. Like if you watch commercials, everybody's like, you know, ethnic on a commercial now. Like there's yeah. everybody's multiracial, you know, like. Unbelievable. Right? Every Unbelievable. Single, like, yeah. There's black and the Asian and the Hispanic and we're all one happy family. And I'm just like, okay. I'm here now. <laughs> so manipulated now and I, I, I part of me feels like that's a way that people are appeasing their own guilt or their own you know self-consciousness of what they've done in the past as opposed to creating something organic like I would love to receive scripts that don't say any ethnicity <laughs> I was I was just right. saying that to my partner yeah just no, just say nothing or Say everyone, because what I get is I get these scripts that they have the Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary, Jane, da da, Letitia. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, you know what, if you're going to do that, because you're assuming the assumption there is that I am perceiving the same world that you perceive, which is if the writer is white, is a predominantly white world. That's not my world. When I read it, and I see Mary, I might be Mary. Jane, I might be Jane. I see all of those as me until I go, oh, I'm Letitia. So if, if you want to do that, that's fine. But then have the, you know, take full responsibility and, and write Caucasian, 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 black. Right. Do that. Own it. You can have it. I don't mind. That's your world. But own it. Don't make me have to point it out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow. Mm. Well, Conrad, I'll let you go. No, no, no. You're you're up this time. You're up. I find this quite fascinating. Please. Well, I think one of the issues for me is um, <clears throat> the way language is used. So I think, for example, a lot of the stereotypical characters that they write for us are so limited. In, in depth, in background, and in language. Yeah. And, and I know that growing up, I used to talk the way I talk now, which is, you know, in this kind of articulate way in which I'm able to express myself using the vocabulary that I need. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this, kind, this kind of expression is not something that's associated with Black people. It's always associated with white characters who are able to be... Um, the typical characters that we see on television and in movies, but when they think of black characters, they always think of us in this very limited education, this le very limited idea of possibilities of what we could be, from uh, you know from gang members to uh, slaves, and they're so uh, stereotypical. We are a diverse people that know how mm. that have all colors of the spectrum. So yes, we have that element in our community that are you know, impoverished and that talk this certain type of way, but that's not the bulk of who we are. That's not everybody. And I think that a lot of Hollywood and, and, the, and the white writers in Hollywood have been lazy about getting to know black people and the, and the complexity in which their character is made up. Mm. Um, I also want to say that, you know, 
the examples that are put out there in the media, what we see, then perpetuates our children and our kids out there to continue the same stereotypes. And, and so it becomes a cyclical thing where the, the people are being dumbed down because the dumbed down images of us are being put out there. Um, that's why I, I thought that the existence of, and I still think that the existence and, and, and celebration of Barack Obama and what he did as president, as a black man, as an intelligent person, Mm -hmm. uh, repre representing a different demographic of who we are that exists, that has always existed from W.B. Du Bois to Frederick Douglass. It's, we've always had these int intellectual black people in our community that have known how to say what they want to say and express on our behalf, mm -hmm. rising us up. But I think white people, uh, right writers in, in the business, don't take the, 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 the time to get to know those kinds of people. And I think slowly, speaking to your point, Raven, things are changing. We mm. are seeing change. We are seeing that somebody like Obama is a visual uh, representation of a, a kind of people that we want to see. Um, and so, yes, um, that was one of the reasons why I felt discouraged in the business, because I didn't want to mm -hmm. take the stereotypical roles. I didn't want to be told in a casting session, can you be more ethnic or can you be more ghetto or can you do it like this? Because, yes, I can be that. Right, but I I prefer to give me background on character. Tell me mm -hmm. what's going on with that character. Tell me what kind of upbringing they had and why they are like they are. Mm -hmm. Not not just you know we're looking for that kind of a person, and that's not enough for me as an actor to 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 to, to uh, portray a character. So I think I think we've got a long way to go, mm -hmm. but we've had some great legends. We've had people that have really paved the way for us: the Harry Belafonte, the Paul mm -hmm. Robesons the Sidney Portiers, uh, the, Brock, the Brock Peters of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to continue to break down those stereotypes. We're going to continue to be more than what they expect us to be and therefore raise the bar of what we see so that there is a diverse representation of us, not just the, the prostitute, not just the gang member, but also the doctor and the dentist and mm -hmm. the lawyer and the police officer and, and the entire array of who we are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah. that's why, thank you for that. Yeah. Because it's so important. It's like, yes, there's the old adage, write what you know. But if the writer is a white writer that doesn't have that, that hasn't done that extra work, then everything that they write is going to be skewed from that one perspective. And it's sort of like, no, we need more. There's a diversity there that needs to be mined. Um, I love Shonda Rhimes and all the work that she has done because she does that. She writes these full characters of all color, but full all characters. Color. And then the strong leads that she has created. I mean, we see how, how they are full human beings, mm -hmm. right? That have, yes, all the foibles and the troubles and everything that they're battling. But it's like, we see who they are as the person first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just... That's that's the exciting work that I love to see, and it it, it is slow and coming. But I I'm always inspired by some of my artist friends who then create their own work. They're just mm -hmm. like, okay, then we need to tell our own stories and and create ways where and forge those avenues where then they can be, you know, the writers on series, the directors. We see it happening. They're slow going, but we still have like great people of color who are directors and writers and producers. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just a matter of creating avenues for us to continue to tell our stories because they are our stories to tell. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm so, yeah, just excited about that. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. Yeah, and, and also one more thing I just wanted to add real quick. Um, we always talk about how education is going to help our community and education does help us better our circumstances, improve our financial situations, and make better people out of us. And so it has helped me uh, mm. elevate my life, education, going to school, studying at UCLA, learning business and economics, uh, just, just being present in that kind of environment. That helps us. But if you want us to raise our, st our status with education, then you can't be afraid of an educated person. No. You can't be afraid to show educated people. Okay. So we, we have to do one. If we're going to do one, we have to do the other. That's right. That's right. I love that. Well yeah. said. Comrade, do you want to? Uh, okay. So, you know, 
I'm born in, in London, England, so I, I don't have a, you know any particular accent anymore. I, I too, I grew up in Ottawa when I was a kid. My mother shifted us over to Ottawa. Um, and so, yeah, my sort of inner urban uh, experience is like zero to none. And yet I was being asked very early in my career to play these gang bangers, drug dealers, and you know, all that sort of thing. And I made a decision really early on uh, to, you know, I studied the classics. That was, that was my focus. That was my way into a world that was foreign to me in terms mm -hmm. of trying to learn to be a better person. And I always felt that, you know, studying Shakespeare, that was the top bar for me. So I really focused on that uh, really early in my acting career and training. And, you know, I went to Stratford, did all of that work, and then I come out and now I'm being asked to like kill somebody and sell drugs on the corner. I was very confused. Mm -hmm. And um, I told my agent many, many times, I'm not going out for this part. And they were like, yeah, but these are the parts. And I'm like, these are not the parts. That's right. There are other parts. And I really focused on being professional. Mm -hmm. Any part that I was starting to go out for really early in my career were the lawyers, were the scientists, were the politicians, everything where the guy was in a suit. Like easily the first 10, 15 years of my, my resume is me in a suit until I got sick of that. Right. But I was, not, I was not going to lower the personal bar. I refused mm -hmm. to do it. And mm -hmm. all the people that were starting out with me who started off down that road, they're no longer in the business. Mm. Yet I've now been able to at least keep my educated status up there. And I was really dead against trying to portray and perpetuate this idea of, and you, you know, you got to be a bad man in order to be a professional actor. I refuse to do it. And, you know, I look back on my career and I'm, I'm proud that I made that choice mm -hmm. really, really early out. I, I really established the fact that, I'm not going to do that. And I was fortunate enough to get to this place, this this far along the road. And so I'm so fat, happy to hear you also share, you know, what you guys had to do in terms of that struggle. So mm -hmm. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Definitely with you. Yeah. Which means really sometimes turning down roles where there are so few roles already for black exactly, people. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. But we're still here. We're not going anywhere. We are exactly. not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think about that. I think about, um, I believe it was Sidney Poitier uh, in one of his interviews, and he talked about that, like turning down roles and being in a position, though, where, you know, you got a family and they yeah. have to eat, you know, and everybody else is like, take the role, take, take the role, take this role. And he just wouldn't based on his own integrity, yeah. where he drew his line. Cool. And it's like, how many people's lives has he touched from doing that? Mm -hmm. He broke so many barriers. He he reflected to us through the screen who we were inside, not okay. what we were being told as. And it's just when I think about that, mm -hmm. when I think about what that takes, it's it inspires me then to do better. Right. This right. is how the chain goes, you know. And mm -hmm. I'm very thankful because um, I, you know I had one agent before previously, but then I joined up with the agent that I have now. And one of the things that I just loved about him and do love about him is how he champions his clients. You know? mm -hmm. And so he will put me in a room, he'll do the thing where if it doesn't say that it has to be a black person, he'll throw me in the room, you know? And, and it's great right because so. the time too, casting, they just, it doesn't, they don't know until they see it, you know That's what I mean? Cool. And That's so cool. when you come in and you present that idea that yes, this character could be a black woman, they're just mm -hmm. like, wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and it takes that foresight. It takes, you know, having a community of people uh, a, around us or the people that we interact with that are willing to open their minds in a way, you yeah. know? And so just a shout out to um, people who not necessarily understand what we go through, but still open their minds to being supportive. Yeah. And a shout out to casting directors who will open their minds to that. Cause that, there's that famous one about lethal weapon, you know, that, that, <laughs> Danny Glover was not, it didn't say black man. And she, yeah. casting director is the one that says it. And if we could have our more casting directors, and you know, here's, you know, I, I also want to say there's, 
you know, we have so many different brothers and sisters, right? Who have so many different stories. And it is not to take away from those whose rhythms are organically, um, you know, uh, unique to themselves and different from others, right? Uh, and we want to celebrate that and amplify that and support that. And that's a beautiful thing. The problem comes when there's a concept that there's only one rhythm to a yes. person of color. And that's what we want to make sure um, doesn't, you know, live because <laughs> there's as many different rhythms of us as there are of white person, of, of people, of humans, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that kind of thing of like, you know, I don't want to disparage or, or um, put anybody in a different sort of like, I don't want to do that. It's not that. It's that I want to do other things as well. And I want to be, as we all have said, I want to, I'm here only for this much time. Life goes by like that. I want to, you know, explore my art in the way that it fulfills me so that I can make it the best that I can to present to the other people, right? And I don't, I won't be able to fulfill my art if I'm manipulating myself in order to fulfill somebody else's concept of me, right? Yeah. I mean, I have to say that's one of the things when I got the breakdown of Rafi, that I literally, you know, sitting there like this, that I kind of like, I just, it, I, 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 w I was ecstatic because it was just, a really fully fledged human. Yes. She didn't, she didn't have no color at all. It was just a human, perfectly imperfect, imperfect. I didn't have to be, you know, just this. I could have my, my frailty and my vulnerabilities and my strength, you know? And that's all that we're always asking as people of color. You know, you just want to go, you know, just, just let us have the opportunity. Let us have the opportunity to tell all the story, all our stories, because all yeah. our stories are stories of humanity. It's, and they just look really cool and tan. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you brought up Star Trek, and I think that um, one of the things that could be celebrated about Star Trek is the fact that it has really put a lot of emphasis on these well-rounded characters that are mm -hmm. not afraid to push the boundaries and that have depth and that have this flushed out background. And there's way more to it than just these, these boxes that are being checked. And I think um, to the credit of CBS and Paramount who have put so much work into developing a quality product like Star Trek, um, they deserve the credit for uh, not being afraid to push those boundaries, not, not being afraid to take those risks and those chances and put the kind of uh, quality material that we're looking to see out there. So I, I, I've been blessed it, by having that obvious, opportunity. It's obvious that it's so wanted because, I mean, the audience, the fan base for Star Trek, you know, it, it's, it's all about the other. Mm. All mm. about the other. I mean, if it doesn't work without the other. That's right. Uh, right? And if they are not going beyond into those places where we've never gone before, blah, 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 like, then it doesn't work. So, yeah, you're right. It's the... Uh, Great. There's a bit of a joke here locally when we go to casting, you know, and of course all the black guys who look like me, we're all going to show up and we're all there and we're like, oh, like, this is the day when they're kind of recasting. And I remember a buddy of mine saying, uh, yeah, this is uh, color correction time. They're color correcting the picture here. Wow. So, please do not adjust your set. We're fixing <laughs> for you. You know, we're just, just going to put a little bit more of this over here and a little <laughs> And it's, you know, the first time I heard it, I was like, yeah, that does kind of feel like that. Like they, That's right. mm. they looked at the board and they went, ooh, this is too much <laughs> of this still. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's <laughs> just this picture. It's fabulous. I, I love the idea. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, I think it's important for us to seek out those roles that they don't typically go for a person of color so that purposely, right, purposely, so that we can present ourselves in those, those places. You know, I, I think I've told this before that I was doing um, an arc on um, 90210, not the original, not the latest reboot, but that one in the middle, right, the one on CW. And my character was supposed to be uh, the event planner to the stars. She owns her own business and blah, 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 blah. And the first day I had, you know, my hair, this, and uh, the next day or something, I get a phone call in the car, and um, from producers, you know, they're like, hi, Michelle, but we have the producers on, for, on you, on the line for you. And, you know, all I'm thinking is like, damn, I did one day and I sucked that much. They're like, 
and we do that normal paranoia. So I'm like, I pulled over and I'm like, hi, what can I do for you? And they said, you know, uh, we love, you know, we show we love you. We love your hair. It's fabulous. But we did some Bye. research. We did some research, which I find, okay, whatever. We did some research and our research told us that if you're a woman of color, you will only be thought of respectfully as owning a business if you have straightened hair. Wow. And I can't tell you, because I'm like, clearly you could sort of sense that I'm not a shy person. I can speak up. Hey, there's research for that? Like, where did you, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Where did you where y'all look that up at? Where, is there an, like, can you, can you Google can you, send you that? Can you, can you fax Google that over that. to me? Let me look I over that. And, and I have to say, I, I was so taken aback. Like I didn't even, I couldn't, I didn't even, I couldn't find any words, you know, because all I could think about is I, Michelle, I'm a person. I'm, I'm just a human being, regardless of whether I was an actor or not. If I chose to have an event planning job, I'd still look like this. Like I wouldn't get the job and then all of a sudden change my stuff. I'm, I'm a human being. I could look like anything. And the fact that they're saying, and, and then also just that point, you wouldn't be respected as a woman of color owning something, unless you look more homogenized. Right, that, right in that moment, that's why, I'm, that's why Rafi has a huge thing of curls, because I was like, you know what? In 2400, we got, we, we, we natural. We kinky, natural, we got it all, so. <laughs> but I think it's, you like, gonna, y'all gonna respect this. Y'all gonna respect, respect this. Respect this. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important for us to really continue to push forward and make sure that when we do get these things, we, um, you know, we proudly represent a non-homogenized look, um, and we embrace the individual and the, um, the diversity the differences and the diversity. Yeah, because there are people watching, and it means so much to see themselves reflected right. on that screen. It that changes is- everything. <laughs> yep. You know? You're not alone or isolated or overlooked or undervalued. Like when you see the reflection of yourself on that screen, it it makes everything else possible all of a sudden. Well, I mean, I think about I Obama. Love. Like Obama, you know, there's there's school room, you know, there's school rooms that they have the pictures of the presidents around the top or whatever. I know I'm so old, but that's what they had back in my day. And all I can think about now, because when we grew up, it was all white, right? White men. Mm-hmm. Now we our little boys and girls, brown, black boys, there's a black man up there. You know, we don't even understand psychologically what that does because now they yeah, see that, that themselves. You know, that could be me. That could be me. That I could, could put my picture up there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I soon to be vice president. That's right. And soon to be vice president. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crossing my toes as well. <laughs> uh, Michelle, you said that your father was an actor. Yep. We just had a conversation. This my dad in a, a movie that he did in oh. Japan called oh, uh, wow. C.E. Oh, wow. And that's, him there, and that's him over there, too. And, you know, he actually ended up um, doing a lot of work elsewhere in in Japan, in Europe, uh, because the speaking world... Speaking what language? Speaking what language in Japan? He was speaking... Well, he, does, he did speak Japanese, um, but there was... A, and I think in the film, he speaks Japanese as well. So it's subtitles, but it's... Yeah. But um, he, he, he was one of those that had, you know, he had to take parts um, because he needed, to, he needed to make a living. And there was a lot of roles that he did on stage and in the film where he didn't let us see. You know, he didn't feel, he was embarrassed. He was like, I, I'm playing, you know, he'd say I'm playing an Uncle Tom or, you know, I'm, I, this is not what I want you to see me as. And, uh, and it hurt him, you know, it really hurt him, you know, in his soul. Um, because those were the only parts that he was he, he could get, and that's why he literally would go elsewhere, at different countries, to to actually get jobs of just being a man, you know, just a, a human. So, um, but yeah, you yeah yeah, my dad was that. Well, this understanding, yeah, of being an artist and being true to who you are, like you, you're you're an extension of that thinking of your father. Yeah, be very yeah. Proud of you. He'd be very, and, very proud of you. Keep that. I would encourage everybody to read. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, no, please go on, Sarah, please. I would just encourage everybody to read a, a book called Here I Stand by Paul Robeson. Mm. And it talks, mm. talks about his struggles as a black man dealing with these very same issues, uh, both from sports, which we use an excellent athlete in, at Rutgers University, um, also to his time as a lawyer, 
um, mm. and how why he wanted to leave that profession because of the racism that he felt and experienced being marginalized in the law firm and, and told to do certain cases that weren't up to par. Um, and also in the acting and music profession where she later on became an actor and a uh, singer. So he he's, talks about all of these kinds of things and the mm -hmm. discrimination that he felt and faced in all of these levels of life, right? Mm -hmm. From athletics to, to uh, the education uh, to entertainment. So I, I, th I would encourage people out there who want to get a, a real good understanding. It's still relevant to this day. It's called Here I Stand, uh, Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sorok. Um, yeah. I just wanted to jump on what Michelle was saying in that these roles, they come at a price too. You know, if you're planning, like I'm thinking of your father, who you're saying that he was hurt. Like, oh, yeah. the hurt and the shame of playing these types of roles where, you know, or we're acting, but at the end of the day, you're saying these lines or you're doing these actions. If you have to play a rapist or you have to play this or you have to, you're doing these things that the body doesn't necessarily know that we're acting. Like you're, you're, re, you're reliving or inhabiting the essence and the feeling of what these characters are or what this, the stereotype is or what the situation may be. And that can come at a great price. Yeah, artist, I, I'd, I'd like to speak to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I was part of a playwrights festival once in uh, uh, Calgary uh, many years ago, and the the writer was coming at it from the perspective of uh, there used to be southern migrant workers that would come up from the states and go to northern Ontario and Canada, and they would do the seasonal work, much like how we take uh, workers from the Caribbean or workers from South America. We give them these temporary work visas. They can only really go to the farms, pick the fruit, pick the tobacco, whatever. And as soon as the growing season is over, back they go. But this, in this one particular story, this uh, man who was from uh, the Netherlands, the family, like in terms of the story, the family was from the Netherlands. And he would take on the black migrant workers. And at the end of the season, before he would pay them, so now they're there from, say, March, putting in the fields. Uh, now we're into harvest, coming up into October, right about this time of the year. So now they're getting ready to get their earnings. They've cleared the fields. They're going to go back. The night before, he would send in his young daughter, uh, who was probably a virgin, and she would entrap the black men, and then he would come in and see them mm. and kill the workers. Jesus. So now they would just disappear right. because the families didn't know where they, where they exactly went when they went north. Mm. There was no communication of once they arrived up at the farms where they were, so nobody would ever come looking for them. Mm. It would just disappear. So he got free labor. And in this particular story, there was my character who was that black migrant worker. And there was a young shady white kid that he hung out with that also went on to this farm. And I remember one day in rehearsal, we're rehearsing this scene and the black workers were not allowed into the house. And in this one scene, I'm, I came into the house. The young daughter lured me into the house. Mm -hmm. I was very like, this is not a good idea. I shouldn't be in here. I just came to get some water. And she goes, oh, come on, sit down. I'm cleaning some fish. Why don't you clean the fish with me? And just at that time, in comes her father. And as I was rehearsing the scene, the spirit, mm -hmm. the best way I can describe it, the spirit just came over me. Mm -hmm. And all of these migrant workers that had disappeared and something in me was now starting to say that there is some real truth to what it is that we're portraying in this story that we're telling. And I had this incredible sense of dread. Now, even though I know we were rehearsing, there was no audience. I was living this moment. I, I swear to God, as I'm seeing this now, I can feel all of the past come right up to my eyes. They're right here. And I could, and I could feel as, as we were doing the scene, and now it became like a, it was like a dueling uh, Bible quoting scene. He would 
speak a line in verse and I would have to counter. I'd find another line in the verse. And we were both very clearly well-versed in Bible studies. But it was the only way that this character survived this moment in, in this story was because he knew the Bible and the white man could see the humanity in me mm -hmm. only through the scripture that I was saying. But I, I recall when I got up, like I had to exit the scene and I like ran out of the rehearsal and I wept. Like mm -hmm. I was, it was uncontrollable, this, this feeling that overtook me of how our history is right there in our DNA. It's right here with us now. It's not necessarily through my bloodline directly, but I know it's through our cultural bloodline. It's, it's always, we're always in that river of, of history. Mm -hmm. The energy of our ancestors and i was just really uh, i don't know how i really want to end saying this but i really felt it necessary for me to share that like, yes it was very proud thank, of you. thank you for that yeah mm. because these are the stories that we're telling these yeah, are yeah. we're the chosen mouthpieces for that i i firmly believe in that no that we're the chronicles of the time. For a reason yeah. right mm -hmm. that's right you know mm. um but to speak to that then, I'm gonna kind of jump here because what I felt you were also hitting on, Conrad, as well is our legacy, past legacy of what, we've, what work we've created, but also in future legacy. Um, so if I could pose, cause we're, we're almost running out of time here. We have about 10 more minutes. Um, you know, one of the great things, the pride that I have in being a part of the Star Trek family, like this role and being able to play Dr. Pollard, I. I I can't even speak to how much it has touched me, how grateful I am to be able to, to talk with the fans. I've had people, you know, message me being like, you know, you're a doctor. It's so important to see a black doctor on screen. And, you know, you have your hair natural. My daughter wants her hair like yours. And, and just, it's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Star Trek has created from the beginning. I mean, having the first interracial kiss, having like just characters, They've created a legacy that speaks to equality, that speaks to who we are. I'm curious as to each individual one of you, is there something that you feel that's a part of your own legacy that you wish to create or, or extend forward and moving on? Like, I, I know it's like a big question, but if there's anything that you can speak to that, because I feel as artists, as actors of color, we're, we are that already. We're, mm -hmm. Everything that we do is, is out there for others to see, to entertain, to inspire, what have you. Is there anything that you consciously feel is something that you wish to leave as part of your legacy or to continue to build on? Mm. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's for myself, I, it's what I've been continuing doing, you know, the choices that I've made. Like, I, I just really want, um, I just want uh, all, like a whole bunch of little brown and black kids with crazy hair and, you know, looking unique and interesting to see themselves, you know, just to see themselves, you know, and to see themselves um, respectfully uh, portrayed and to give them, um, you know, maybe to inspire them to seek out a vocation that I, that I portrayed perhaps, or, um, you know, whether they want to do acting or not, but like an actual job of a role that I've done, you know, and, and just to see that there are people who are here, um, who have been here, um, who are continuing on. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We are strong, we're diverse, we're intelligent, we're interesting, um, we're funny. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Oh, beautiful. That's right. Full of love, full of empathy, understanding, a depth of understanding. You know, if there's anything that, uh, you know, I've really realized during this whole time, during this, you know, quarantine and during this, uh, you know, the, the, the painful viewing of videos and body cams and um, just injustice, you know, is to say that we are here. We're not going anywhere. We're not afraid. We're strong. We have a point of view and we are on the right side of history. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And yes, that's, we are. That's, that's what I want to continue to, sh to, to present. Yes. Thank you. Hmm. Anyone else? Sirak, Conrad? 
Well, um, you know, going forward, um, there are some things that I'd like to get done and, and have as part of my legacy. But one of the important things that I think I'd like people to remember and focus on is, you know, I, I was able to work on Star Trek and portray the future. And so mm-hmm. we have we are putting putting imagery that is the future selves, ourselves of the fu- in the future and as part of the future. And I think we we're, we're all of us are doing a great job of 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 representing ourselves, our people in a very well uh, articulate way. But I want to say that also, in addition to seeing a better future for us and seeing a place in the future for us, I think that we also need to understand our past and it needs to be used as a tool to better us and to mm. and to um, give us confidence of who we are. I think a lot of what they talk about when they talk about African-American history, a lot of it in, for me growing up was about slavery and it was mm. about a very narrow, limited view of black people on the planet. Um, but yet, if you were to study well, European history, it was always about this kingship and you know the knights and the mm. and the royalty and and so they have a vision of themselves that emanates from the you know King Henry and Queen Elizabeth in the Victorian area and, and all of these things that are you know so uh, uplifting if you know that that's part of your history. And I think that we need to also understand that part of our history is the exact same kind of royalty, the same kind of um, uh, uh, education. You know, we, we have an ancient history that uh, has kings and queens um, and, and, and culture. And, and I, need, I think that a lot of our African-American history should also be tied to our African history and where our roots are there how we've come from such greatness and you know from dynasties ourselves from from uh from leading egypt eight thousand mm-hmm. years ago to 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 being where we are today still here on this planet and still thriving and doing what we do and making our impact known so i think there uh i would like to going forward kind of touch on these stories that talk about black greatness that talk about black excellence um beyond the scope of the limited view of just you know this minimalized version of slavery in american history that we have we're way more than that we're part of the the building of this country and we're part of the building of the ideas that founded the ideas that founded this country Mm -hmm. the origin the origin of of these kinds of thoughts um so i think that we need to get in tune with those origins so we know that about mansa musa so we know about the 25th dynasty in egypt so we know about who we are as the people and see ourselves as, as kings, as queens, as royalty, of having the bloodline, of, of being part of the biblical stories. We need to know that we're part of all of that. It's not a European thing. It's actually a European thing that was stolen from us as well. <laughs> so I think mm-hmm. that if we, if we start to learn more about who we are and see ourselves in these kinds of ways, it will help change the narrative. It will help break the stereotypes. Um, because it's, it's too limiting to say you're you're descended from a slave and that's it. Right. Because that's that that makes me. Where do I go with that? Right, right. What do I use that? How do I use that um, to to better myself? I, I think I think knowledge of self is the thing that's going to really set us free. And and um, knowledge of self and our history is um, the thing that's going to make us elevate to the place of the future that we want to be at. Mm-hmm. Nice hey, man. Yeah. Yes. I think I, you both have really said it, you know, you've used all of the things that I've wanted to say, you know, just really the one word that comes to me is the, the, the dignity. Mm. dignity and our humanity that is not allowed to be shown really in a real way. And, you know, again, because of the choice of roles that I've, I've taken and the path that I've wanted to sort of show and, and keep showing, you know, let my children be proud of who I am and let them be proud of who they are. You know, there's to have our head up and Mm -hmm. not always having to be looking down and to know that we do have the education because we're there now and to, you know, know that we, we belong like to really reinforce this fact long before the black lives matter movement, though it's incredibly important, you know, we do belong and that we are a part of this society. And as you 
say, Chirac, you know, we built this. We built this. In fact, mm -hmm. a lot of what they're doing is built on what we did mm -hmm. so as, a, as a human race, as a part of the human race story. We are part of this collective conversation. And I, I really do want that to be echoed. And you're right. Star Trek does allow these characters to do that. So, but to have that really come into the humanity of the, the human storytelling, I would love to have more of that. But it's, it's about access, and I think we're still working on that. We haven't really spoken about that, but it's, it's, it's part of it. It's part of the problem, it's part of the solution, and it's where we should definitely be going in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Wonderful. Thank you. Is there anything else? I mean, do we want to speak more to that, Conrad? Um, is there anything else that you want to oh, address? I, I, or? I, I think, you know, I've said my bit anyways, and I just really appreciate what the others are saying. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add that, Raven, just really quickly, that we're in front of the camera, and I'm blessed that we've had the opportunity to be in front of that we're still continuing to be in front of the camera. But there's also work to be done on the other side of the camera. Right. Right. Writing, writing, the, writing, 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 writing. The writers, the showrunners, the executives at the networks. Yeah. We need to we need to be there too. So not yeah. just being in front of the camera, but we also there's a long list and a long line and a big wide opening for us to That's right. to make to make our mark be, uh, on the other side of the camera as well. So. Yes, please. Absolutely. The next frontier, absolutely, right now. Um, this has been incredible. I feel like we're almost out of time, so I don't know if there's anything else that uh, anyone wants to add to this. Um, it's already been such a fabulous panel. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, is there anything that you want to give a shout out to as well? I mean, any, um, well, I'll give any you projects that, that you? I'll give you a little yeah. shout out. We got something called Trek the Vote which yes. is going to be on October 13th. It's with the Biden-Harris campaign. Five shows, 19 actors, four politicos, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Cory Booker, Stacey Abrams, and Andrew Yang. There might be some more that will pop in, but come join us. Uh, it's just, uh, it's going to be fun. Those guys are all huge Trekkies, so they're going to ask us a bunch of questions. We'll ask them, and it's all to um, help Biden and Harris get uh, get in the White House. Get get in the. We need to reclaim that house. Reclaim that house. We built it. Let's reclaim it. <laughs> Let's say thank you for uh, coming up with this idea. Fantastic idea for a panel on a segment because this is this is a needed conversation, and these conversations will spawn other conversations. So uh, kudos to you for taking this on as a challenge. Thank yeah. you. I feel like this is just the beginning. You know what I mean? Like there's so many more conversations that could be had on this. Um, we're just representing, you know, um, the African-American perspective here, African-Canadian, Afro-Caribbean. Um, mm -hmm. But there's so many. I mean, all okay. people of color. I, I don't say minorities because I that's something that I'm not. I'm not. I'm right? not minority. <laughs> But there's so many people of color and um, we all have our stories and it's like for a full view, for a full rounded view of who we are, who we are as a community, who we are as the earth people, I feel like it's so important that we have these platforms to just talk about who we are and what we yes. do. Thank you for Absolutely. that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, well, thank you for sharing your story, Michelle, Conrad. I mean, yeah. it's awesome. I mean, people are going to love and grow from that. This, this is this is a healing type of situation we're in. This is the moment mm -hmm. for us to, you know, really evaluate where we are and and take steps to improve our condition. Yes, yes, and go vote. <laughs> and go, go vote. vote. <laughs> go vote. Um, want to share much love um, to Ryan for putting this together and for doing the, the panels, these conventions. Everyone come on out, enjoy, connect. We're here and um, just everyone be safe in these times, right? Uh, send a lot of virtual hugs, a lot of love. Um, look at what's going on in the community and just speak your truth. Speak your truth and share your love. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Live and prosper. Uh, they prosper. know what it is. <laughs> <laughs>